Hey everyone, how you doing today? Uh, I'm Chris Brown, editor at Bobbitt Business Media. I run Automotive Fleet Digital, uh, Fleet Forward, Auto Rental News, and Business Fleet Magazine at Bobbitt. I've got my hands full, certainly, um, and I'm really excited to talk commercial electrification and really kind of what's driving the market today. Um, but thank you, Catherine and team, for inviting me. Uh, we've got a lot to cover in this half hour, so let's get right to it, okay? Um, first off, we're going to go into different segments of fleet to kind of see what's kind of driving the market in, in these different segments as it relates to electrification. All right, let's start with government fleets. Really kind of first adopters uh, in fleet electrification 1.0, and a lot of that really has to do with regulations uh, that were saddled with, with government fleets to clean up, right? And, and a lot of it's on the West Coast, particularly California. Um, you know, they've been uh, first adopters. It's kind of the push pull of the regulatory environment. And also they had incentive monies to make this happen, okay? California certainly leads that with their HVIT program, which is not just um, for government fleets, but New York State um, now has programs as well. Uh, New Jersey just introduced a really strong uh, VIP program. Uh, Colorado has, has uh, programs, and to a small extent, Illinois, Maryland, and Connecticut. Um, now, really what's driving uh, a lot of the angst, I suppose you'd say, in government fleets, particularly in California, is a new rule uh, that they're going to be voting on soon, and that is that all uh, vehicle, 50% of vehicles class 2B and above in government fleets need to be zero emission vehicles. Um, uh, I'm just gonna let that one hang right there and move to the next slide because we'll, we'll see how that's one's gonna play out. All right, so public transit, school bus fleets. Um, uh, you know, the infrastructure bill is really driving adoption here, right? It's for transit in particular, 1.1 billion in new funds to help cities purchase uh, electric buses for the public transit system. Uh, school buses have 17 million for school districts. Um, and uh, you know, there's some realities on the, on, the, on the school bus side with district budgets. It's still very taxing for them to get into uh, uh, electric buses, even though they do have the money to do that. Um, there's issues with whether their rebates or grants and a lot of rural districts are having a hard time um, you know, applying for the rebate process. Um, all right, tell you what, let's let's move on to last mile delivery fleets. This fleet segment is really about duty cycle. Um, they're manageable daily miles. Uh, it's a return to base operation, right, for charging. Uh, stop and go duty cycles in traffic, uh, in, in, in cities, in urban areas, uh, they want the, the, the quietness of, a, of an EV and no tailpipe emissions. And when you're running heavy utilization, you're going to uh, cut that, uh, that premium quicker, um, the, e the, the premium that you're going to pay for the electric vehicles. All right, large commercial fleets. Well, we we've, we've certainly see adoption here from fleet electrification 1.0 and even in other uh, propulsion types, alternative propulsion types, you know, back in the day, right? We're talking about the public companies. Uh, we're talking about the Walmarts, the FedExes, the UPSs, you know, they're traditional testing ground for new propulsion technologies. They've got the financial resources um, and they've got, uh, you know, the, the pilot programs that are really a fraction of their overall size. Um, but, um, you know, they they have been really kind of first adopters and we see this, uh, uh, continuing for sure. All right. Here's an interesting one. Rental fleets. Now rental fleets have really been taking baby steps up until about six months ago when Hertz laid down the gauntlet with this, uh, deal with Tesla and then with Polestar. Um, and really that's driving a wake up call to the rest of the rental industry, to get on the electrification bus. Uh, you know, really what's kind of interesting about what's going on in rental is that they are fleeting vehicles and there's kind of a question mark, particularly on airports, 
on whether the infrastructure to charge them is actually there. So we almost feel like we're in an environment of fleet first and worry about infrastructure later. Oh gosh, gulp, right? Um, moving on to corporate fleets. What I'm seeing driving this market um, is really ESG, environmental, social, and governments. In the past two years, particularly for public companies, this has really sprung up um, as an issue. Um, you know, we've seen that uh, companies are now willing to pay a premium to green their, their fleets. And it's really about their corporate perception and brand and, uh, and also about the supply chain. Um, if you're a fleet and you have a green fleet and you're part of a supply chain uh, now, you may be picked because of that, uh, because you're satisfying ESG. So trucking, um, you know, we're talking class eight, we're talking over the road. Uh, where we've seen movement traditionally, and I'm even, I just got back from the ACT Expo in Long Beach, right? So Long Beach port, um, shipping, drayage, uh, the, you know, the 710 in California uh, down to the Long Beach port is, they call it the diesel death quarter. They, they can measure emissions and really understand that diesel is, is kind of causing this. So they really want to clean up the ports. Um, now, another over-the-road trucking, um, you know, the, the expense uh, to electrify these Class A trucks is pretty severe. Uh, they all, all the OEMs play in this market right now, but I, I, we see adoption taking a few more years uh, over the uh, lower classes of vehicles. All right, let's move on to an analysis of the market. Let's start with uh, the Detroit 3, right? Um, you know, listen, in EV 1.0, it's like, heck, they're, they're, they're on the sidelines, right? Um, and we were all kind of looking for mm -hmm. like, hey, when are we going to have an electric pickup? And boom, in the past two years, it's happening, right? That day has come and that, and really it can potentially move markets. Um, and it has been. Um, you know, I did see the slide earlier today in a presentation that Wells Fargo thinks that uh, the traditional incumbent OEMs are at peak prop profits and it's going to be hard to transition to EVs. Well, I, I'm interested to see really how that's going to play out on profitability. But, but here we are, and uh, there's, there's volume on these units. Um, so into this breach, right, comes, and I don't want to bully over with this next slide, but I guess I will, the independent EV makers. Now, there's, there's a lot of them. Uh, and they keep on springing up. Uh, and in the past, you know, four or five years, this market has gone from, from nothing to about 30 players, okay? Um, generally playing in the commercial EV space from, you know, um, three quarter ton pickups all the way up to class six. I'm not including in this slide class seven and eight because it's its own animal, right? Um, but um, let's, let's just take a look at this market for a second. I wanna back up and look at light duty vehicles sold in 2021. That's, that's essentially the passenger car in, in, in van market, right? So class one and 2A, 14.9 million units, okay? In 2021, it was a banner year for pure electric vehicles, 434 and change, uh, 100,000, units of pure electric vehicles, that's 3% of the market. That was satisfied essentially by traditional OEMs. You know, we can throw, you know, Fisker Automotive in there and, and, and some independents. I'm considering Tesla traditional at this point, I guess. Um, now, looking at the commercial vehicle market uh, during, for last year, right? Um, about 12 million units sold that were registered as commercial vehicles. So um, what was the amount of um, you know, units that were registered uh, that were electric vehicles? I don't know the number, but it's gotta be a thousand units, uh, you know, 2000, uh, very small. These new independent OEs are looking to play in um, you know, niches in this market. So really the boom is yet to come or is supposed to come in this market. Um, 
Now, we're, we're really going to look at how this is all going to play out, right? Each of these players is going about production differently. They are converting existing ICE chassis from major OEMs. Um, they're building their own skateboard platforms. And you can put your own, they, they're putting their own bodies on top and they're working with a variety of different body manufacturers. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're all, they're taking different parts of the market, last mile delivery, vocational, uh, medium duty, um, you know, box trucks in class six. Um, and what they're saying, a lot of what they're saying is that we'll leave the traditional OEs to handle kind of the, the, the lower, like the van delivery market, like Ford with the e-transit, and they're going to take um, you know, like a, a, a one ton van uh, application, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, there are folks that think that there's an overhang of demand and that overhang of demand in terms that will gobble up what these uh, new OEs are selling. Um, I, I'm waiting to see if that is going to uh, fall out like that. I mean, I, I kind of hope it does. But make no mistake, on the manufacturing side for EVs, the class three to six market is super hot right now. Um, I do think it's going to be still based on incentives, okay? Uh, the premiums are still pretty high. Um, and incentives are frankly driven by states. And I gave you some of the states that have really kind of um, put more money into uh, chopping down that premium for fleets. Okay, now... Um, Moving into the space as well, we've got some, you know, traditional van and truck manufacturers. They've got EV platforms, uh, the Shift Group, uh, erstwhile Utilimaster, right? Uh, Blue Arc EV Solutions has has come from from you know nothing from a piece of paper eighteen months ago, uh, and they've got a, a a really good platform in a, in a body on top of that for for deliveries. Uh, we've got Freightliner Custom Chassis as well. Um, and just announced in Long Beach at Act Expo, Bluebird, uh, you know, the school bus uh, manufacturer, they're getting into class five and six EV chassis. Now they've got the footprint, right? Um, they can satisfy, uh, you know, sales through their existing sources and they can, they can also, uh, um, you know, repair these units and, and maintain these units too, which is a leg up. Um, so we've got to look at that uh, into this market. Um, all right, now we're going to look at what you need to kind of concentrate on if fleets need to uh, or want to dip their toes in the independent uh, OEM market. And I can tell you very personally that I've driven some of the product. It's great. You know, some of the some of the vans out there. Uh, some of the trucks out there from these independent manufacturers, electric vehicles, a pretty great product. Uh, there's a lot more that goes around to it too. Some of these are questions you're going to need to ask the, the, the OE specifically. And the other stuff is like your, how you're going to kind of figure out, um, you know, what the, their overall strategy is. So, you know, you want to look at like, what, what market segment are they going after? How big is that market? How many units do they intend to sell into that market? And what's their competition for that market? Um, manufacturing and production. So in my world, uh, you know, in media, I hear quite a lot about, hey, listen, we're shooting for Q4 of 2023 to produce, you know, to start production. And then you want to ask them, well, what are you, what, what's your plans for production? Do you have a production partner, i.e., do you have a, a, a facility that you're going to produce these yet? And I have had some of these OEs say, not yet. Um, I, we're in a fast timeline, but I'm not sure that they're going to actually be able to make that timeline up uh, by Q4 to actually start producing vehicles. Hey, we'll see, right? Um, uh, you know, what we what what the these new OEs are talking about too is is production um, flexibility. Are the plants that they're using um, producing other lines? Are they are they are they up and running in other ways, or is that factory essentially dark, waiting for uh, you know this this OEM to start producing electric vehicles? 
I can say that that, that flexibility is what all the new OEMs are, are looking to do. And some are actually producing products for, uh, for other third parties while they wait to produce their own vehicles. And that's going to help them kind of manage the cash burn essentially until they, they get to production. Um, vehicle engineering. Um, so many different ways to produce these new electric vehicles. Some are sourcing parts from different manufacturing and manufacturers in assembling those parts into what is going to become an electric vehicle. Uh, others are taking uh, parts that are, um, you know, a, a, their own, they're producing their own batteries, actually, and they're producing their own chassis, and they're producing their own bodies. Uh, they may also be outsourcing bodies from other, from other entities. Um, you want to know what they're going to do with their chassis. They call it a sled or a skateboard. Um, do they have multiple uses for that? Or are they only going after one, one market? A lot of these answers, there's no right and wrong. It's just, you know, what your, uh, um, it's just information that you're going to need to, to gather. Um, and frankly, you're going to get in these vehicles and see how does it, how does it drive? Uh, I've driven some that I don't, I personally don't feel drive very well, I, uh, you know, and I don't have my, uh, you know, my CDL, right? Um, and the look and feel, it really does matter. Uh, and I've driven some that, that really feel like, hey, I, I could drive this every day. And that's going to be super important. Financing and funding. This is a tricky one if you're not in that world, but understanding your, your, your money raises, you know, how much money they're raising. And is it a drop in the bucket compared to how much they're going to need to survive? Um, you can do some research on C-suite, right? I mean, uh, how many has the, the CEO of the company left and for what reason? Um, that's going to tell you, uh, give you some hints about where they're going. Okay, sales and service. This is huge too, obviously. Um, how do they t intend on servicing the vehicle? What is their national footprint? Can they get to you uh, if, if they're dealing with a, a, a truck dealer in, in Iowa and they're trying to sell you something in, in Texas, um, can they service the vehicles? Is it uh, where we're going to do mobile servicing? Is that going to be enough? Um, you know, how many sales, uh, what's their sales force look like nationally? Uh, you want to know what their service partnerships are and, and how well they're, they're inked. Okay, software. I'm going to talk a little bit about this at the end of the presentation, but all electric vehicles, particularly commercial electric vehicles, come with software. Uh, and most of these OEMs, even the new OEMs, have software packages that are going to manage and be connected to charging, uh, understanding like uh, you know how these vehicles are operating. This is critical to understand their ease of use and their UX for their software packages, what APIs they have to connect to other um, you know, softwares is gonna be critical. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, partnerships, Who, what upfitters are they working with um, you know, to put bodies on top? What kind of integrations does that look like? Uh, and even from charging infrastructure, do they have any partnerships with the EVGOs and the charge points of the world and the blinks of the world? Um, good questions to ask there. Um, okay, so let's get back to um, really one of the major challenges for fleet electrification on the, on the fleet side. And that is charging and charging infrastructure because to a person, when I talk to uh, fleets, especially non passenger car fleets, what their biggest challenge has been, and it has been charging. Um, you know, you get the thousand yard stare like, wow, okay, I'm trenching. Um, I'm working with my utility. Uh, I'm trying to work the grant process. Um, I'm trying to find out power needs. I don't have enough power coming to my site. Um, I have enough power to my site now, but five years, I don't think I will. Um, Hey, the good news is um, your utility is going to be your friend. All of them are gearing up with resources for fleets. Um, they want to be good partners uh, to you. Um, you know, listen, other issues, uh, um, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with public charging networks. They all have their own app. 
You know, how are you gonna how are you gonna manage different apps for for charging? Uh, or are you gonna be charging behind the fence um, most of the time? Hopefully, all of the time if you can help it. Um, and then you know, listen. Uh, most utilities now have some form, well, most, uh, I would say most don't, but at the very least, if you're in a state that doesn't have money um, to defray the cost of an electric vehicle, ask your utility, they may have money to defray the cost of your infrastructure, and it, and it could be fairly substantial. All right. So, you know, listen, it takes a village to electrify. So um, even uh, uh, folks that are, you know, like suppliers, talking about electric vehicle suppliers, traditional OEMs, they are understanding that they need to consult with fleets and to have other services that are going to help them because they can't do it alone. So you've got manufacturers like, uh, you know, uh, Ford uh, who bought Electrify, um, uh, you know, it's a suite of services, software packages to really kind of help fleets uh, manage the process. GM's getting into the game and you know, we want to get on to the bigger uh, classes. Uh, Pino has a program as well. Um, certainly the fleet management companies, they are starting to create their separate divisions that are going to go full in on, on helping fleets. And they are making the partnerships um, that fleets can plug into through their fleet management companies to help. Um, we've certainly also seen third-party consultancies spring up. Uh, my bullet points here are a fraction of the third parties that uh, all do things just a little bit differently. Some help you finance the vehicles actually. Um, uh, most are gonna you know, help you make a use case and, and, and understand uh, usage patterns uh, to, to which vehicles that you can electrify first. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're good resources. All right, so really coming back to, and this is actually um, uh, my last slide, believe it or not, uh, we, we got there pretty quick. Um, you know, you talk about charging as being the major, you know, issue that is kind of overlooked when you're at square one. Connecting your vehicles, the data that you pull from your vehicles, the software that you're going to install to make this all happen should not be overlooked as well. These EVs, they're computers on wheels. Um, you know, you're going to be able to do over the air updates. Um, you know, and, and if you've got recalls for these vehicles, a lot of recalls are now being satisfied by over the air updates. Hey, uptime, right? Um, but managing different softwares, as I said before, different charging app softwares, and also um, if you're using one OEM software package, what happens if you decide to go with another OEM's electric product? Well, you're going to have to learn another software package, right? Do you scrap the initial one or do you go to a third party? Um, all things to consider. <laughs> It's a lot to consider for sure. Um, but what this is going to do, if you are not managing your software properly, you are not gonna be managing your charging costs. You're not gonna be understanding when and how your vehicles are plugged in uh, or if they are plugged in. Um, and certainly you're going to be able to use uh, 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 your, your telematics partners as well. And I'll put those in the group of consultancies. Um, your the telematics companies, the traditional telematics companies, if you're hooked up with the with them, um, they are now getting into being able to read um, chargers and, and, and understand uh, the data coming out of electric vehicles. Uh, certainly one thing to look at too is you have traditionally you've got your internal combustion en engine trucks and vans um, mixing and matching that data between the two. Is going to be uh, is going to be an issue, um, and you're going to want to be able to um, examine, you know, um, you know your performance from your EVs and your performance from your inter internal combustion engine uh, as well. Certainly, on the supplier side, uh, you know, as we look at the EV market, 
it is understood that, uh, you know, we, or we hope or we think that EVs and fleets, particularly, let, let's just call it, you know, certainly on the passenger car side up to class four, that these vehicles can live in fleets longer than they have. Um, so these OEs are not going to be able to, they, they're, they're going to be selling less vehicles into the market, I mean, particularly on the passenger car side, the class one, two side. Um, so they're looking, these software packages are going to come with um, subscription services, and you're going to have to build this into your, um, your fleet budget. Uh, and, you know, their software packages are going to cost them a, a monthly service fee per unit. Um, now, the data that is coming out of those vehicles, your vehicles, your electric vehicles as a fleet, uh, is going to be invaluable to a lot of different, um, you know, entities. So how that data is monetized is something that's really happening in um, the EV space. Well, it looks like... Um, I am uh, uh, just going to come up to my last slide. Uh, that's me um, last year driving in eCascadia. And um, I uh, it didn't take one of, there's three brakes. I didn't remove one of the brakes. I don't have my CDL, as I said. And I flatlined uh, the brakes and uh, um, kind of um, screwed up the tires a little bit. So there's my sheepish grin uh, uh, for, the, for the moment. But um, hey, thank you all for listening to me. Um, I don't have, I do have my email address. It's chris.brown at bobbit.com. Um, I welcome any questions and I would like to invite you to the Fleet Forward Conference. Um, and that is November 9th through 11th in Santa Clara. The conference is all about fleets and mobility and certainly electrification is a big part of it, but not the only part of it. We talk autonomy, we talk connectivity. Um, and certainly folks in this uh, environment um, in, in Catherine's event, including Catherine, Jim, Kirk, and Steve have spoken at that event. So um, with that, um, I bid you an adieu. Uh, please hit me up with any questions. And I do appreciate uh, being part of the uh, um, presentation today. Thank you.